Here are 10 things fly fishing beginners should know. Fish safety and handling. Let's take gentle care of our finned little friends. When you catch a fish, try to release it within 30 seconds. It's best to keep the mouth and gills submerged in flowing water the entire time. This helps keep the fish calm and relaxed while you're handling it and trying to take out the hook. It should make it easier for you. Besides fishing barbless hooks, one thing I'd recommend is investing in a good rubber mesh net. This will help a lot when you're catching and releasing fish. Compared to other fishing nets, the rubber mesh netting is a lot safer for the fish and it doesn't damage the gills as easy. When the water feels as warm as a bath, it's definitely way too warm to be fishing for trout. If you're looking for an approximate water temperature range, usually when it's around 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius, that's when it's way too warm and it's too stressful on the trout. And one last thing, before you go handling any fish, make sure that you wet your hands in the water before touching it. Wetting your hands helps protect the slimy coating that keeps a fish safe from infection and parasites. I'd also recommend to stay away from very abrasive gloves that also has a tendency to remove the protective slime. Gear is nice, but it's not necessary. When you're first starting out, you don't need to spend a lot of money on fancy gear and accessories. A rod, reel, fly line, leader, tippet, forceps, and clippers are really the only things that you need to start. Then add some sort of box or container to house your flies and you're all set. You can absolutely spend less than $100 on the entire fly fishing setup and still get the job done. In fact, my first fly rod I bought for $20 and I use that for almost a decade. And while you could make an argument for waders, they're not really a necessity, you could just wet wade. They are really handy when cold temperatures come in and you're walking through a lot of brush or let's say poison ivy and you're not really fond of ticks. But let's say you are going to spend some serious cash on some fly fishing equipment. What's really gonna be the most bang for your buck? And that is gonna be your fly reel your fly rod, and your fly line. You're gonna get the most out of that by far. And if you treat them well and you keep them in good condition, they'll last you decades. You'll see the greatest return on your investment and it'll also improve your fly fishing level. You don't need a ton of flies. There are literally thousands of flies that you could choose from, but the truth is you really only need like five or six to start with. As a beginner, I would recommend these six flies. Adam's parachute, a zebra midge, hare's ear nymph, pheasant tail nymph, woolly bugger, and an elk hair caddis. These flies are great no matter where you go and you can fish them across the entire United States. They're very versatile flies that imitate a lot of different insects. So no matter where you go and no matter what's hatching, you can basically toss on one of these and imitate a range of different insects. Make sure you have more than one size though. Trout can be very picky eaters and a lot of the smaller sizes can help fool trout. Now, if you are looking to build out your arsenal, adding new flies to your box can help when you're targeting the same stretch of water over again. Sometimes all it takes is a different profile, shape, or size to get a fish to eat. Nymphing is the easiest way to catch fish. If you're really struggling to catch fish, try nymphing. Over 80% of a trout's diet is subsurface. There are two easy ways to nymph fish. The first, you can use suspension nymphing, using a strike indicator, which is just a, a fancy way of saying a uh, fishing bobber. Or the alternative is using a tight line technique like Euro nymphing, which is incredibly effective. I promise you, if you get half decent at nymph fishing, you'll vacuum fish out of any stream you go to. Learn two or three fishing knots really well. There are dozens of fly fishing knots and it can be confusing. The good news is, is you only really need to know two or three fishing knots really well, and you'll get through pretty much any situation. For a beginner, I would suggest that you master these three fishing knots. First, the improved clinch knot, which helps you connect your fly to your fly leader. And then the double surgeon's knot, which allows you to add new sections of tippet onto your existing fly leader. So it helps extend the life and also gives you a longer leader. And the handshake knot, which allows you to connect two loops together, which are usually found pre-tied on the end of your fly line and fly leader. Practice your presentation. The biggest mistake I see a lot of beginner fly fishermen making is they don't present their flies well. This can be attributed to a lot of different things. For example, the dry fly is saturated 
and it's kind of sinking, so you're not getting a real good drift out of it. There's too much line on the water and they're not mending properly. Their positioning is kind of poor on the stream side, so they're not taking advantage of you know wind or something. And they also don't have a lot of experience in casting. But presentation is king. You could have all the flies in the world, but if you're not presenting that fly well and passing it off as a natural, you're not really going to catch many fish. Learn to mend and reduce drag because faster current is pulling your fly line downstream. Your goal is to make it look as if your fly is the real thing, as natural as possible. And achieving that is what we call a dead drift, where your fly floats downstream like it's a dead insect. But in some cases, you may want to add a twitch in for like a grasshopper, or maybe some movement or skating a caddis fly across the surface. You know, we can get into more detail about that, but essentially a dead drift is gonna get you the most amount of fish. Learn to read the water. Trout are like the ultimate couch potatoes. Their goal is to eat as much as they can using as little energy as possible. Trout will position themselves quite literally so that food is funneled right into their face. Finding trout is easier than you think. Most trout will be found in what's called a seam line. This is where fast water meets slow water, and it makes this definitive line. One quick tip is to follow the bubbles. Bubbles, just like insects, are funneled directly through the seam line, and it's one easy way and an indicator to see where food might be traveling and where trout might be. Another place that you can find trout are in what's called an eddy. Eddies are swirling currents caused by flows passing over and around obstructing objects, such as large boulders or submerged rocks. As water passes around these objects, it creates a reverse current that pushes it into a swirling motion or a slow patch of water. These places can be small or even quite large, amassing a pile of debris and foam. Slow pockets of water like these are great as holding areas for trout that just want to feed on insects that are drifting by in the faster currents. They like to swerve in and out of these safe areas and into the seam lines created by obstructions that create these eddies. Feeding trout like to stay at least a few feet away from a safe area that they can ditch into if they sense a predator. Fallen trees, shade, boulders, branches, undercut banks, deep water, and riffles are all common places that trout will use as a refuge. Use these places as markers to pinpoint where you might find trout. In most cases, Actively feeding trout will be found at the head, sides, and back into the pool. It is very unlikely to find trout right in the center and at the very deepest point. Usually those don't have a lot of food flowing through, so they're used as more of a resting area and where they hide away from predators. Use a grid system when you're fishing. When it comes to fishing pools and runs, try using a grid system to maximize every inch of the water. Separate the main current and flow of water into multiple grids or threads, and then fish the one closest to you first. This helps leave no rock unturned. Usually we prefer to position ourselves downstream of the pool at the base and then casting upstream. An upstream presentation allows us to stay out of the trout's line of sight while also giving us a better angle to cast. Rather than cast your fly directly on top of the fish, it's actually better to cast several feet upstream and letting it drift downstream towards them. Be sure to mend your fly line to avoid dragging your presentation and scaring off any possible chance that you had. Keep your distance first and then work your way up the pool from the bottom. Get to know your bugs. Entomology is the study of insects. Not only can learning the different insects make fishing more fun, but it can also drastically improve your fly fishing. The five most important insects you should know how to identify are caddisflies, midges, mayflies, stoneflies, sow bugs, or scuds. Now I'm not saying that you should memorize their Latin names or know all their subspecies, but at least you should have a basic understanding and knowledge about them. Ideally, you should be able to recognize what's hatching and then choose the appropriate fly. You don't have to match insects 100%, but you should get close in color, size, and shape. Timing is everything. When it comes to casting your fly, timing is a make it or break it. One of the biggest problems I see with beginner fly fishermen is that they're not taking a long enough pause between their backward and forward cast. Casting too quickly and not giving time for your fly line to load energy into your rod will cause you to lose momentum and your fly line will drop. The best thing to do is to pause until your fly line has completely straightened out behind you. You should be able to feel the weight of the fly line flexing the rod. Once you feel that weight, that's when you can cast forward and make your presentation.
One extra helpful tip is to restrict your rod movements to the 10 and 2 positions on a clock while casting. Lowering your rod on either side will put slack in your line and ultimately ruin your cast.